Okay, everybody, uh, welcome once again. Uh, thanks for joining in uh, for today's session of Worship Ministry. Um, it's good to see you all and uh, good to hear that you all are doing well. Okay, continue to stay safe. Okay. Um, so uh, before we get started, can we, uh, can I request one of us to uh, start, start us off with a word of prayer, please? Anybody? Just go for it. Oh, please, Master. Lord, we just want to say thank you for giving us this privilege to study more details about uh, the work ministry. Lord, we just want to say thank you again for your sacrifice that, uh, Lord, we can come boldly uh, and able to worship you wherever we want to and whatever we want to look for. Lord, as we continue with the worship ministry, take us all, us all to, to, to another level, uh, to be a worshiper who will worship you with spirit and truth, so that, Lord Father, so that people will see you in us, Lord Father. So, Lord, I submit all these students, past devotion, into your loving and in Jesus' most precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. I hope you all can uh, see uh, what I'm sharing, the notes. Okay, so I hope it's all visible. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Great, guys, thank you. Um, so let's do, let's do a quick recap of what we've covered so far, okay? Let's just go uh, right to the top and uh, just quickly, uh, you know, uh, recap everything that we've covered. So we started off by talking about uh, the four altars of Abraham and uh, we see that how, what the altars represented. Uh, the, the altar was a place of testimony. It was a place of worship. It was a place where sacrifice took place. It was a place of adoration, acknowledgement, uh, appreciation. Uh, it was basically a place of worship. And we see how Abraham was a man of altars. Uh, you know, he built four altars. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure he must have built more, but that we don't know of. But um, you know, he built uh, four altars, and we, uh, you know, we saw each altar signified something: uh, an altar of uh, obedience, an altar of intimacy, right? An altar of uh, commitment and uh, separation, um, a new covenant uh, unto him, and the altar of sacrifice. And all of these altars signified and symbolized something wonderful something great and at the end of that section we see that god is not only expecting us to uh, be uh, men of altars but he's also expecting us to be on the altar according to romans chapter 12 verse 1 um, and you know a huge takeaway uh, and an encouragement for us is to live our lives that is worthy of a calling to offer up our bodies as living sacrifice right um, so that was section one and then in in, this, in the next section, worship in the Bible, we begin to see how worship ministry was organized in the Old Testament. And very briefly, we read a few scriptures from uh, how it was organized in the Tabernacle of David and also in, in Solomon's first temple. Okay. and how they would uh, offer up sacrifices and then music was being played uh, and with loud instruments, with loud voices, with unity they will all come together it was a it, it was a play it was a time of celebration it was a place of celebration um you know there and just some sing simple songs saying lord your love endures forever okay um so that's what we saw and uh worship in the second temple was a little different because during that period uh we saw that the jews had take, been taken into exile because by then the temple, the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, right? by the invasion of the Babylonians, uh, which Jeremiah also prophesies about this when you read his book. So in this section, they're away for 70 years in exile. And in that period, uh, we see that, you know, they had no place uh, to come together together. Uh, 
you know, corporately in worship because the temple was being destroyed. And uh, so they would meet in houses, uh, you know, for the small gatherings and whatnot. Um, and, but when they do come back, when they get the permission to come back and build that second temple, uh, you know, which spanned for approximately 420 years, as mentioned here. Uh, so we see that Ezra and Nehemiah in these scriptures follow and practice the same thing that King David and the kings before them had practiced. They would again appoint the priests uh, with trumpets and, and, and musicians with musical instruments, everything with the sacrifices. Uh, they would follow the same thing. They had not forgotten their ways completely. Okay, so this was the return, uh, the way worship was organized after the, their return from exile and after they built the second temple. Uh, and then in the next section, which was um, on the lighter note, we see that uh, how, uh, what the Psalms talk about music and worship, right? Uh, we uh, cannot talk about uh, worship and ministry and not talk about Psalms is what we looked at last week. Um, and we tried uh, answering, you know, some of the questions that the journalists would ask, you know, just to make it interesting. Uh, the Psalm commands who should praise him, everybody, everything that has breath and everything that does not has breath, praise him. It encourages us uh, where, um, everywhere, right? Uh, even on your beds, praise him. Uh, in the mo when, in the morning, in the noontime, in the evening, praise him. Praise him at all times. Let his praise always be on your lips. Okay, let his praise always be on your lips. Let God be exalted at all times, right? And how uh, the psalmist says we 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 praise him by lifting up our voice with with the shout of praise, with lifting up our hands, with dancing, with clapping, with with loud music, with trumpets and cymbals and ram's horn, etc., etc. Okay. Um, so those were the things that uh, we saw in that section of what the psalms talks about worship uh, and music in the Bible. The next section was about worship ministry in the New Testament. Uh, this is where it gets a little interesting, a little, just a little different, uh, because the introduction of synagogues uh, is, is, is happening here. And we see again that this was developed during the Jewish exile uh, of the Babylonian days, okay? So they would meet in small houses, right? As we said, that uh, <clears throat> so the people of Israel would gather around their leaders, or their elders to listen to the word of God, to receive instruction and to worship. Okay, you see that? The people of Israel would gather around their elders who listen to the word of God, to receive instruction and to worship. Um, and this form was retained and matured after the return from the exile. And it became a normal part of Jewish religious uh, life. Okay. Um, okay. And a number of scriptures we see in the New Testament that Paul and other disciples continue to observe just because they became Christians, right? Um, they were Jewish Christians, the first century Christians, they did not forget the practices of going to the temple and praying uh, and, and observing certain fasts and festivals and whatnot. So here are the scriptures of Paul uh, and Peter and, and other disciples uh, observing those practices that was followed uh, in the New Testament. Okay. And then we concluded last week's class with uh, just at a different note of what the New Testament talks about singing, uh, because singing uh, is one of the aspects of worship, isn't it? It's not the only aspect of worship. It is one of the aspects of worship, and it is important. And that's why it is, uh, you know, uh, the multiple verses that encourages us uh, to sing. Okay, we see that uh, in Matthew 26, 30, that Jesus and his disciples sang after their last Passover, Passover meal together. Um, in Acts 16, 25, Paul and Silas sang. We, we've looked at that scripture many, many times, isn't it? Um, 
And then in Romans 15, verse 9, it says, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Uh, amen. And so multiple verses like that. And uh, Ephesians 5, 19, it says, Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual uh, songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So the definition for psalm is simple. The psalm of David, uh, it was sung by the Jews at the temple. It was just another song, a hymn, a prayer. Right? A hymn means, uh, on a, again, once again, a song, spiritual songs, um, songs related to spiritual things. And melody for these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is assigned a source, the heart God has created, right? So melody was made by musical instruments, but here we are we are commanded to, uh, um, you know, say we are commanded uh, and to use our hearts. Let that let your heart be an instrument that makes melodies unto God. Okay, so uh, this is where we concluded last class. I uh, you know it's quite a bit of a recap, but I hope we are all on the same page. Uh, is everybody on the same page? Yeah, we are. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, Manu, I see that you're asking, uh, I see. You asked this question the last time as well. Uh, uh, you know, as the, why the temple was destroyed. Um, so basically, the Babylonians invaded Israel, Jerusalem, and they destroyed the temple. So it was actually uh, the acts of the sins of people of Israel that God let the enemy come and destroy. Um, so that's one of the reasons. Um, and this Jeremiah prophesies uh, in his book. So I would encourage you to uh, look into that. Okay, is that clear, Manu? Okay, no problem. It's fine. Right, but it's very interesting because uh, now you have to, uh, if you're going to read about this, the destruction of the temple uh, and the exile of the Israel to the Babylon, it's very important that, uh, that you read the book of Nehemiah, Ezra, and uh, Jeremiah, and, and Daniel also. This is all happening you know, parallelly around the same timeline. Okay, uh, it's very important to read these uh, prophets because uh, it's all happening. Daniel, uh, you know, was uh, he? Uh, Daniel was an official in Babylon. He served for four different kings uh, during his time um, for over sixty years. So it was all. It is all happening during that exile. So it's important that we read Nehemiah, Ezra, Jeremiah, even Lamentations, and Daniel. You know. Or parallelly. Okay, cool. Yes. Um, any questions, guys? Any other questions so far? Okay, is it all making sense? Um, are, you, are you able to understand? This? Okay. Kiran is saying clear. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, that's that. That's just wonderful. Then uh, let's just continue. Uh, so today we uh, look into a new topic. Uh, we look at how we are going back to the Old Testament again, but we're just going to look at, uh, in particular, specifically, exclusively, uh, worship in the tabernacle of Moses. Uh, how worship ministry was organized, uh, you know, in the tabernacle of Moses, the importance and the significance of it all, okay, and why we need to understand uh, from it, okay? Um, so, the tabernacle of Moses, as it says, uh, was a roadmap, okay, that God gave Israel to help them understand how to enter his presence, Okay? We have to understand that very clearly. Okay, it was a roadmap. It was a blueprint it, it, that was like almost like maps. You know that God gave Israel to help them understand how to enter His presence. Okay, that means that they just could not enter however they liked or do whatever they wanted to do, but there was 
uh, a clear instruction. There was a plan that was given. There was a roadmap. There was uh, there was instructions. So it was a copy and a shadow of the sanctuary in heaven, the true heavenly tabernacle. Okay. So uh, let's see here. In reading from Hebrews chapter eight, this now. This is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which Lord erected and not man. Okay. The true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you will make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, in Revelation 11, uh, verse 19, it says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Okay, so by these two scriptures in Hebrews and in Revelation, it's very clear that there is an heavenly tabernacle. Okay, and the tabernacle of Moses was just a copy, a shadow. Uh, it was shown to Moses, and he made a note of it. And then out of those instructions, he built. However, like it says in Hebrews initially, uh, it says it is a true tabernacle that the Lord erected and not man. Okay, so therefore the earthly tabernacle will teach us something about the true heavenly tabernacle. And that is why it's super important for us to understand the significance uh, of, of the tabernacle of Moses and how worship ministry was organized. Okay, but before we get in before we just start looking at the different aspects like the uh, you know like the outer courts the inner courts and the holy uh, the holy place we all know that right um, you've learned about it in the old testament survey in your first years uh, and everybody you know even a non bible college student a christian um, would knows that okay you know there's outer courts inner courts and the holy place but what was the significance why was it even important for Moses to come down with the blueprint, right? So uh, for that, we need to just go back to the book of Genesis, guys, okay? Um, I'm going to read for us. Um, okay, um, I'm going to just read. Uh, this verse is not, uh, again, in the notes, but uh, just please follow along with me. Um, Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 onwards, okay. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, just to give us context, it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some. And ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord called the man, called to the man, Where are you? I like the KJV version, it says, Adam, where art thou? Um, verse 10, he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Okay. 
we need to start the tabernacle from here, guys. There was unity before sin entered mankind, before sin entered the world, before, before the fall happened. God and man walked hand in hand. But when sin entered, there was a separation that was created. There was a divide, it says right in verse 8, they hid themselves, okay? They kind of distanced themselves from God, okay? It was like a dislocated shoulder, uh, uh, like a deadly disease of some sort, okay? It was the separation, okay? And Ephesians 2, it says we were dead in sin, okay? So, and every time we read death in the Bible, in the biblical context, it's talking about separation, okay? So when we die physically, uh, we are separated from our spirit, isn't it? That's what that's what death does, okay? So the spiritual death is what happened here, is when they ate of the fruit, when they disobeyed, their spirit was separated from the spirit of God, okay? Sin had entered, um, and it was like, okay, and that's why God comes and asks, Adam, where are you? That doesn't mean that Adam didn't know where he was. It's God. He knows everything. It's almost like, you know, a kid searching for something. It's like, Adam, I cannot find your spirit. Where is it? Where are you? Because God is spirit and he communicates to our spirit, isn't it? Okay. And everything... Um, and so once that happened, from this chapter to somewhere in the in, in Exodus 20, that's about 2,500 years, guys, okay, approximately, more or less, from the time of the fall from Genesis to some, in Exodus 20, the, dis, the gap, the timeline gap is 2,500 years more. So... For that, that, those many years, there was no resting place for God. There was no abiding place like how he used to walk in the garden, how he used to talk with man face to face like he would with, with Adam. There was no uh, resting place. But, but you would see in the Old Testament, you know, most uh, until that time that his uh, there was he will only visit the god would only visit like his hand was upon uh, isaac his you know he would come and visit uh, and and speak and then just go away but there was never a resting place a dwelling place there was no uh, abiding place and uh, and uh, we um yeah uh, and, but then God, what God does is um, years and years later, uh, again, going back to the book of Genesis, after the fall and generations go by, generations go by, and then God starts a new race altogether, right? A, a new breed. Uh, he take, chooses Abraham uh, and then he prophesies to, he prophesies to him in, in Genesis chapter 15. Okay, you guys with me? Genesis chapter 15, okay, um, verse 13, it says, Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. Okay, if you are not with me, uh, the reference is Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. It's amazing how the Lord is prophesying to Abraham about what's going to happen uh, in, the, in the years to come, in the generations to come. Verse 13, one more time, just for our benefit, it says, Then the Lord said to him, Know for sure or know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. Verse 14, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves and afterward they will come out with great possessions. 
Okay, so this is the promise so, uh, that God is, uh, you know, uh, giving Abraham. This is a prophecy. Uh, and then we see that it being fulfilled, isn't it? That Jacob and his sons go into Egypt as a family, right? Uh, Sunday school stories, we all know this. Uh, Jacob and his family go into Egypt uh, because of Joseph uh, and everything. They go in as a family and God uses um, the Egypt as a furnace of affliction. He incubates them and they come out of Egypt as a nation. That's incredible, isn't it? So now Israel is not just a family that went in, but they come out as, as a nation. Okay, so um, and once again, if you uh, now let's go to the book of uh, Exodus, uh, if you will, please. Uh, book of Exodus, chapter 5, verse 1. Okay. This is after Moses' encounter with God in Exodus, chapter 3, and he's given this, uh, he's been given this mandate. Uh, he goes there and he sees. Exodus 5 verse 1 says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the, the God of Israel says, Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. And Pharaoh says, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And I will not let Israel go. Um, that's again just a backstory of, of all these things, right? And now let's go fast forward to Exodus chapter 25. Okay. Exodus chapter 25. I'll wait for you guys. Can someone read? Uh, it's it's going to be a, a, quite a bit of reading, and I hope that's okay. Okay, so all we are doing right now so far is is setting the context as to why is the tabernacle of Moses important? Why was it important? Why was the tabernacle itself important? Okay, um, Exodus chapter twenty five, and I would like someone to read from verse one all the way down to verse twenty two. Exodus 25, verse 1 to 22. Or if you want to uh, uh, have two people read it, let's one of one of you read from Exodus uh, from verse 1 to verse 11, and the other person from verse 12 to 22. Okay, someone please. And the Lord spoke, spoke unto Moses, saying, "Speak unto the children of Israel." that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and bazar skin and sitting's wood, oil for the light, Spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense. On the stones and stones to be set in the apple and in the breastplate and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Okay, just, just pause there. Thanks, there. Just, just hold on one second there, okay? So let them give everything that they've been commanded to give. And verse 8, again, okay, if, underline in your Bible if you have to. Okay. Then have them make a sanctuary for me. Okay. After they've given everything I've told them to give. Okay. Now, just uh, hold on. We have to remember, these are the same people. By now, the Ten Commandments was given and they had already built a golden calf. Okay, these were the same people who gave their earrings, their brace, their golden bracelets, their golden chains, the necklaces, and everything for the golden calf to be built. 
but after that god again in his great mercy he he tells make the same people who gave to that idol let them give once they give everything let have them make a sanctuary for me okay um and that i will dwell among them okay so the tabernacle simply in the hebrew word is used there is o l moed it means a tent of meeting a dwelling place that's what the tabernacle is okay it's a dwelling place a tent of meeting okay uh right uh, sorry they go ahead according to all that i spoke them so they after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof even so shall ye make it and they shall make an ark of chitin wood two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof and a cubit and a half the height thereof and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without shall thou overlay it and shall make upon it a crown of gold round about thank you dev uh, can i request somebody else to continue from verse 12 to verse 22 please verse 11 no verse 12 ma'am you shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side and you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay with sorry them with gold you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them the poles shall be in the rings of the ark they shall not be taken from it and and you shall put it into the ark the testimony which i give, i will give you you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and half uh, and a half its width and you shall make it to cherubim of gold of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end you make you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one one piece with the mercy seat and the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above covering the mercy seat with their wings and they shall face one another the faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark and in the ark you shall put the testimony that i will give you and there i will meet with you and i will speak with you from above above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which i will give you in commandment to the children of israel amen thank you manu thank you so much thank you dev uh why did i make us read this whole thing why is all these you know the cubits and the measurements important uh because god took this thing very seriously isn't it um you know he goes into the details of the colors uh um uh, you know of what it should look like the curtains and everything which wood to use and now here's the important part okay after god says after they've given everything that i asked them to give that they will give uh, from their from their heart and after you have built everything that i have told you to build the way i have told you to build verse 22 it says there above the cover between the two cherubims that are over the ark of the testimony there i will meet with you 
and there simply there i will dwell with you okay after all these years after 2500 years at least since the fall without a dwelling place without a place without a resting place uh here god says okay you know what i've missed you since the separation and i know that you miss me so this place is going to be a bridge between heaven and earth this was the place where humanity would meet with divinity okay it, it, it was glorious it was beautiful it was supposed to be a marvelous it was like a beautiful encounter a beautiful exchange a divine exchange that was happening so this is the context and the importance uh you know for us to understand just the tabernacle we and every time we speak about the tabernacle of moses we can't just start off with the outer courts and inner courts and this is the background that went in that everything that happened and the reason why the tabernacle was given to them at that point of time right are you, are you all with me yes sir yeah okay so now with all of that in mind uh let's start with the uh in page 6 i hope you can see yeah one of the first things that you notice uh and if you have to enter into the tabernacle is the gate and uh, we don't talk about the gate as much right we only directly talk about the outer courts uh you know the altar of sacrifice and what not but without the gate you're not going to come in isn't it right and this famous psalm as we all know it psalm 100 verse 4 says enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise okay thanks is related to his goodness we are acknowledging his goodness his greatness his mercy we thank and praise him because he has saved us we thank and praise him for for we see what he has created okay um and in john chapter 14 verse 6 you see that the gate is the door into a christian's life okay why 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 do i say that and we see this uh, jesus said to, you know saying himself he says jesus answered that i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me and in john chapter 10 verse 9 he says i am the gate whoever enters through me will be saved and he will come in and go out and find pasture okay so how is this gate or of the tabernacle of moses symbolizing jesus you know uh, how is this in, portraying the image of that so the gate was made of four colors remember we read that in exodus 25 right blue purple scarlet and fine twined linen that's pure white beautiful white okay the gate was made of four colors and each color represents something in the kingdom okay so the color blue represents divinity uh, something of uh, of heavenly things um, okay so so christ as the heavenly one as the son of god i worship him okay so christ is the son of god he he come he's he's divine in his nature he's divine in his origin so that's that's what the color blue signifies and shows and the next color we see is the color purple and the color purple is associated for a long time with the royals it is the royal color the color of the kings okay um, Uh, you know those long things that the kings would wear those days the robe right that would be just to show off their royalty it would be in the color purple so um the ro- the color of the king's garment and and acknowledging that in the Ma- the gospel of matthew how jesus is portrayed is he is the king of the jews so as my king 
I obey him. Okay, so the first color is color blue. He is a son of God. And as a son of God, I worship him. And as my king, I obey him. And in the gospel of Luke, uh, we see that he is the friend of sinners. Okay, so the scarlet is just red. Okay, the color of the blood typifies the suffering, the sorrowing, sympathizing savior, seeking and saving the lost as revealed in Luke's gospel. Uh, he's shown himself as a friend of sinners. And as my savior, I give my life in surrender. And finally, white or fine linen. In the gospel of Mark, Jesus is portrayed as a perfect uh, and a righteous man, spotless and blameless without sin. Um, so we encounter Jesus in all of these four colors. As you enter the gates, you are coming through those curtains of mere four colors, isn't it? And uh, in a way saying that you are encountering Jesus in this fullness. Okay, so these are, these are the colors also reflected in four gospels that we just saw. So in the gospel of Matthew, Jesus is shown once again as the Messiah, as the King of the Jews. And Luke, which signifies the color red, uh, shows Jesus as a servant, as a suffering servant, um, as a friend of sinners dying for us and shedding his blood for us. And in Mark, we see that he is a perfect and a sinless man. In blue, we see that Jesus uh, as a son of God, as John portrays it in his gospel. Okay, so once again, just to go back to this verse, Jesus says, I am the gate. When you enter through the gate, you are en encountering me as the son of God, as, the ki as your king, as your savior, as your perfect and righteous man. So when you end, you are, and this is what's happening as you enter the gates with all of this, you are encountering Jesus in his fullness. Okay. And then after that is which we resume into the outer court. Um, okay. So what we'll do right now is uh, we'll pause here. And, uh, and uh, is there any questions, guys? Have you all understood anything uh, so far? Just going to stop presenting for this session. Yeah, is there uh, anything that you would like to add or any insight that you took, uh, took from what we've covered so far? Come on, guys. Okay. Yeah, Siddharth, Dave, Prince, uh, everybody. Uh, what, what, what kind of, uh, what kind, of, what, what could you take away from what we've covered so far? Okay, why is everybody quiet? Come on, guys. Um, I mean, for me, it's something. Yeah, sorry, Thomas, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Sinesh. Okay. Yeah, for me, it's something about, like, uh, unity before the fall of sin. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's something, like, interesting, that there was always unity when we were with God. And when we sin, it's always a separation. And uh, so, do I mean Jesus was the only person who came to die for that, and, you know, so that we can connect back with God. And also, another thing that I saw was the colors, you know, red, white, purple, scarlet. I'm, I mean, the only thing that I knew was red, white, and I think those two. That's it. Like what does really represent meaning? But after reading all these color stuffs, like you know, it made me. I really like this to know because I like doing moment in worship, my personal worship. Mm. So I was right. trying to yeah. buy flags and stuff like that to do it. 
So I was really thinking that last week, what are the colors, especially biblical, I wanted to know. And uh, after reading this, right. like, you know, I would like to get more ideas, you know, what does really color represent, you know, so that I can get those stuff. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, I actually have a document on colors uh, that signifies, uh, you know, the kingdom. And, you know, just God created colors. Come on. I mean, he's the originator, isn't it? It's his idea. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I'll share with you, Siddhar, sometime. That you can go through it and it'll, hopefully it'll Thank help you. you. Yeah. All right. Thomas, uh, go ahead. Uh, the thing is, um, you told the suppression in the Garden of Eden. God uh, gave the picture. That in the, I, I can see the heart of God. He want to dwell in the midst of his people, have a fellowship with them. So yeah. again, after a long gap, he sent Jesus because that is a particular where so much of distinction, like the barrier, he sent Jesus. That's really... What I uh, understanding here, I'm taking that. Yes, yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Aaron. Aaron shares. Yeah, God told Moses the tabernacle should be like a bridge between heaven and earth. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, Kiran. Would you? Prince, Kanan. Hey, you guys are there, no? Okay. All right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Okay, right, guys, uh, we will uh, we'll stop here. We'll take a break. I'll stop the recording. Uh, we'll resume in our next session.